John Fleming is a drone operator and trainer. Dr Rhys Clothier is president of the Australian Association for Unmanned Systems. And Shara Evans is a technology futurist. They joined me a short time ago to discuss how drones are changing our world now and in the future. Shara, gentlemen, thanks very much for joining us. John, can I start with you because you train people to use drones and you're worried about these changes. What is your biggest concern? Uh, yes, good evening, Matt. Good evening, all. Um, my biggest concern, I guess, is the safety of our industry. Um, the industry has boomed very quickly and, and the regulations obviously haven't kept up, hence these changes that are being rolled in. Uh, but my biggest concern is they're, they're, they're loosening the regulations a little too much, which will pose, I believe, a greater risk to our industry in the safety aspect, not just for people on the ground, but also airspace. Well, these things have the capability of joining manned aircraft. And in the uneducated hands, can, it's a concern. Oh, because you don't need any training and you're away and you might fly yourself into a, a plane? Yeah, well, the, the sub two kilo class, as, we, as you'll hear bandied around a lot, that's the ability to fly a, a very small remote piloted aircraft without the need for certification. Um, they still have the ability to, to join manned airspace and hit things they shouldn't and be put in places where they shouldn't. Uh, Dr Rhys Clothier, can I bring you in here? Do you disagree with what John's saying? Oh, look, there's um, very little evidence to suggest that the level of risk will increase from commercial drone operations as a result of changes to the regulation. And we've had an impeccable safety uh, record for the commercial industry over the last 14 to 15 years. Uh, what we are seeing is, is an increase in the number of people who are undertaking training ahead of these changes of the regulation and uh, industry associations providing professional training programs and, and all these suggest, all these facts suggest that, um, that, that we won't see this, um, this, the skies filling full of um, untrained and unsafe um, commercial operators. Are you actually um, more worried about the commercial operators or the hobbyists? We, as an industry, are more worried about the commercial operators and the current changes to the regulations um, do not address uh, un, uh, the hobby uh, group. So what we're worried about, and we're seeing an increasing number of incidences, and I'm sure John would agree with me that these incidences, are, are the majority of them have been caused by uh, hobby users. And, can, can I um, pose a point there, though? Those, yeah, sure. yeah. Those, yeah, John? those hobby users are now going to become sub-2 kilo untrained users in the commercial space. Rhys? Yes, to, to an extent, many of those hobby users will make the, uh, make the jump across, mm -hmm. but not all hobby users are unsafe. There's only no. a small majority of them that yep. are ignoring the regulations, or in some cases, they're completely unaware and of the regulations. And the key thing here is about educating them and improving the regulations that apply to hobby users, and also and enforcing those regulations. So I feel a lot of the debate around the current changes to regulation are misdirected. We sh our concern should be uh, more directed towards just, these small proportion of hobby users. I just want to bring Shara Evans in here. Shara, you've yeah. been uh, aware of what's happening in the US. Is this kind of like an Uber situation where the policymakers just had to change because everyone was just doing it anyway? Well, people are doing it anyway, but I've got a couple of concerns echoing what the guys were saying. From a safety perspective, we have to consider that we're putting aircraft that are two kilos and 400 feet high, 122 meters. If something goes wrong and these craft fall, it's going to have an impact at about 175 kilometers per hour. If that hits somebody, that's going to be a very bad situation, whether they're a commercial operator or a private operator. And frankly, there are a lot of things that can go wrong, even if you have a trained operator, much less an untrained one. So for example, wind shifts, you know, even in commercial aircraft, wind shears can be a very dangerous situation. With a lot of these small drones, they're controlled by radio frequency communication devices and you can get a lot of different interferers, even big birds. A garage door opener can interfere with it. You know, so there your are th you know, is in telecommunications, telecommunications so yes. you know about yeah, this. Yeah, exactly. So there are things that can actually interfere with a person's very well-intentioned and even very well-trained capabilities of controlling a craft at that kind of height. Now, yeah, look, in and, and I think you're, you're exactly right. There are um, very legitimate risks around the operation of, of 
drones, particularly in populous areas and in, in busy airspace. Um, but CASA have assessed those risks and, and the regulations actually put very stringent operational restrictions. So you can't fly your UAV over populous areas near, uh, within 30 metres of a person, uh, beyond visual line of sight, and all those mitigations are in place to help reduce those risks. But unmitigated, I agree, there are some risks associated with the use of and these and systems. Can I just add that, that one of the big problems we've got is that the, the small drone industry has not been around long enough for us to get a clear understanding of what the statistics are. And with every Christmas that goes by, there are more and more drones taking to the sky. <laughs> We've only seen these small RPAs in the air, or sorry, remote piloted aircraft for the, for the RPA, for the abbreviation. We've only seen about three or four years of statistics that we can actually call on. What mm. happens five, six, seven years from now when the population of drones has tripled? Are yeah, we even we sure should... of what happens when an RPA flies into a helicopter or flies into a plane? No, we don't. It hasn't happened yet, but it will. Yeah, we, and look, we should, we, we should have wait. to accept, just like with the road toll, we're, that we use cars, we're going to expect people to get hurt. If we want drones, we're going to have to expect people to get hurt. No way. There, there is an element of risk associated with the use of any technology. Drones, like civil aircraft, like helicopters, or even vehicles, as you point out, are no different. There is an element of risk, and we can never reduce that to zero. So but why to do touch we relax the, point, the laws to get trained? But to touch on that point, we shouldn't wait for statistics and accidents to happen to go about regulating the unmanned systems. And look, the relaxation of the regulations are for a very small and niche uh, sector of the industry, and there's no evidence to suggest that it's the risk will increase. Small. It's not very small. There are more, more of those drones sold than any other size on the planet. So do you think as soon as one, one accident happens, John Cassa will come in and take away these rights? Well, the question I've got for Cassa is if, not if, sorry, when that accident happens, are they going to be able to stand hand on heart and say they did everything to try and prevent it? The approach that CASA have adopted is a risk-based approach, which is consistent with that used in the FAA and also in Europe. So no, they've no, got no, a very no, good no, justifi no, no. The justifiable requires, approach. The FAA requires a pass. I'm not talking about yeah. the regulations in place. I'm talking about the approach they use to develop the regulations, yeah, sure. which is justifiable they and require, it's a risk-based approach. They require that pilot to still sit a test. Why are we not yeah. doing Shara, that? I just, do. Shara wants to jump in here. Yeah, in the FAA... Um, Absolutely right. The FAA does require a remote pilot mm -hmm. um, license as opposed to a full pilot's license. They also require that for any drone that weighs more than 250 grams, it has to be registered and the payload has to be noted. That's a big difference. Let's, so at least that way, if it crashes, you know who it belongs yeah. to. Yeah, and let's not forget that CASA are world leaders in the regulation of this industry. We've had regulations in place for more than 14 years, coming on 15 years. We have an impeccable safety record. In fact, we are the most experienced to regulate civil drones. It's only in the last two years that the FAA and Europe have started to develop their own regulations, and there's no justification for us to go mimic them. In fact, there is an argument that they should be looking to us and saying, well, what is happening in Australia. They've been doing this for 15 years and have a very good, a lot of experience in the regulation of drones. Can I just pose a point with the, with the two kilo benchmark? Yep. Um, I, I'd really like to ask someone who is more knowledgeable in the area than I, that the difference between 1.9 kilo and 2.1 kilo being at a risk level. How can we say on one hand this machine that is 2.1 kilo is far riskier to fly than the very same machine with a different camera on it that now weighs under 2 kilo. Yeah, I guess they had to draw the line somewhere. But I just want to, before we run out of time, I want to move on to the other very, very important issue that people care about with drones, privacy, Shara. Yeah. Like, is it a matter of time, for instance, that we see paparazzi flying these around? They're already doing it in America. I don't know if they've been doing it here, but there have <laughs> already been cases where um, real estate companies have been using drones to do aerial um, shots of beautiful homes and inadvertently catching the neighbour next door nude subbathing and putting it on air. Um, there's an incident that I know of... Because you can yeah, you know, go yeah. live from, from drones already. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, you can watch it on streaming on the live. internet. There have been drones that have been... Um, basically what I would call trespassing in apartment complexes and taking pictures at, you know, high windows. You have an expectation of privacy if you're up on a fourth floor window facing the ocean that nobody's going to be peeking in your window. And these craft are able to do that with high definition cameras and infrared cameras, and they're getting cheaper and more powerful all the time. Reese, if someone got a ladder and, and put it up against the high rise and looked in the window, they'd be charged. But we can do it with a drone now, can we? Yeah, look, um, privacy is a very 
serious concern of the industry as well. Unfortunately, in Australia, the privacy regulations are really piecemeal and there's a lot of work that needs to be done to develop the privacy legislation for all technologies, not just drones. And we've had some instances, as, as pointed out, where, where accidentally drones have been used to capture people in their backyards. But um, what's really important is we go out and we educate operators on privacy management principles, how they can go about reducing the risk of breaches of privacy, whether inadvertent or not, um, and so that we can reduce that, that potential for privacy breaches. And John, uh, do you think we should just rely on people's, uh, you know, goodwill not to abuse no, this? Absolutely not. Right now, uh, with the new regulations, somebody can register with on the CASA website and in five days fly with very little education whatsoever. And I don't understand how education is a bad thing. All right. Um, Shara, what about the dangers posed by drones? Could they be used, for instance, terrorism, assassinations? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, already I saw a, a custom-made drone in the US where someone took a commercial drone and attached a gun to it and was using it to be able to shoot stuff you know, off of stock posts and just for the hell of it, I guess, because they're a gun culture. There was an incident about a year ago at the White House where an intelligence worker decided to go out um, and play with his friend's drone after a night of drinking and decided to go for a lark in Washington, D.C. and accidentally crashed the drone on the lawn of the White House. <laughs> now, mind you, this is the most highly defended perimeter in the world, and the drone got through. What they if don't it have wasn't... a sense of humor about yeah, that, do well, they? What if it wasn't a drunken lark? What if it was anthrax? Or what if it was a bomb? It could happen. You know, it's not hard. All right. Well, I'm, I'm afraid we uh, could keep talking about this for hours, I suspect, but I'm going to have to leave it there. Shara Evans, John Fleming and Rhys Clothius, thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you, you indeed. Thank, thank you. you.